Thank you, guys. Let's take our Bibles and let's go to First Timothy chapter three, please. First Timothy chapter three. And I was going to uh, preach. All right, who took my glasses? Thank you, James. Oh, I have them right here. I didn't have them on, I couldn't see. Thank you. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so last week I preached on, um, what did I preach on? Uh, baptism, Lord's Supper, and uh, also uh, church discipline. And I was thinking, praying about this, and I thought, you know, let me just move on from there. Our church is very familiar with this, and, and that's good, and uh, praise the Lord. And But I want to talk about some other items concerning the church. So this has to do with the fellowship of the church, and it's, it's like a family. So let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and let's pray and ask God to bless our time, and then we'll dig into the scriptures. Our Father, thank you so much for the day. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts this morning in both uh, Sunday school and Sunday morning. And we praise you for that. We pray also that you would have your will in this service. Help us be careful to be like a family. And uh, I pray, Father, you bless you upon this. Help me speak uh, and be very clear in my speaking. I pray, Father, you bless our time, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's take our Bible and go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and notice, if you would, verse 14 and 15. The Bible says, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest behave thyself in the house of God. And this is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Now, you may just brush over this. Oh, thank you for standing. Forgive me. Uh, but this is, these, are, these are such wonderful verses here. When it says here, be, how to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Amen. And the pillar and ground of the truth. And then notice chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, please. The Bible says, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. And young men as brethren, and the elder women as mothers, and younger as sisters with all purity. Thank you. May be seated. So you think about what the Bible says, you know, the church of the living God. That's so important. It's not a dead Savior, living God. And then he goes on and says, you know, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. And the younger men as brethren, uh, and elder women as mothers, and the younger as, and younger as sisters, with the all purity. So the Word of God describes the New Testament church in different ways. It's described as a marriage or a family, which speaks of a, a family. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, speaks of uh, maturity and development. Everyone growing in the Lord. Uh, the church is like a field, which speaks of fruitfulness. Church is like a building, which speaks of a right structure, a sure foundation, pillars. And the church is like a body, which speaks of unity. And the church is like a bride, which speaks of purity. So there's many different applications we can make towards the church. But I wanted to study today about the position of of the church as a family. And the first thing we see is the position of a family. The Lord describes to us through his word the proper position of each family member. So let's go to chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and uh, we'll notice verse 3. The Bible says in verse 3, but I, have, uh, I would have you know the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So God describes a family uh, as God, Christ, man, 
the woman and children. Oh, this is not politically correct. That's what the Bible says. Amen. The Bible says that settles it. That's right. And uh, so we, we, we abide by this. And then the Bible speaks in Ephesians chapter 5. Let's turn there, please. Ephesians chapter 5. And notice God speaks here of Christ and the church. He says in verse 32, uh, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Notice verse 22 of the same chapter. And he says in 22, why submit to yourselves on your own husband as unto the Lord? For the husband, the head of the wife, as Christ the head of the, the church, and he's the savior of the body, therefore as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be their own husbands in everything. So the wife pictures a church and the husband pictures Christ. And so the Bible teaches that the wife is to submit herself to the husband. But God says before those verses, he said, the, the husband and wife are to submit themselves one to another. So that's the first thing. And uh, the church is to submit to Christ Church is subject the, uh, to Christ. And what is the position of the church? Uh, the idea is that they are to submit or be in subjection to Christ. What's the position of Christ uh, to his father? Submission and subjection. Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. What, will, uh, what should be the position of man to the Lord? Submission and subjection. What should be the position of the wife to the, Lord, to the Lord? Submission and subjection. And he goes on in verse 22, as well as unto the Lord. What should be the position of children to the Lord? Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, submission and subjection. So everyone's in submission and subjection to God. That's what God says. And the church is in the same position. The Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the church, and uh, the church, the bride, the family, is in subjection um, uh, to the pastor and uh, is the earthly overseer of the God's work. And then we see in Acts chapter 20, in verse 28, let's turn there, please, where the Bible speaks of the pastor. The Bible says in chapter 20, verse 28, uh, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. So we, we see here where the pastor is to be an overseer. And why? Now notice verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing, shall nice wolves and in among you not sparing the flock. The grievous wolves. And I'll tell you, when a wolf gets in, the flock will be destroyed. So I'm a wolf hunter. And I watch people as they come in. I observe people while I'm preaching. Every so often I hear this faint howl. I get on my guard because I'm going to blow that wolf off the face of the earth. Right. Oh, you shouldn't kill animals. I'm going to kill them. I don't like wolves. Why? They take the church and they're grievous. They'll tear it apart. And I'm, I'm a wolf hunter. Amen. Know that if you're a wolf. Amen. Your days are numbered. Amen. So notice Titus chapter 1, please. And verse 7, there are lots of ways to deal with a wolf. You say, well, preacher, you know, you're missing a, one leg and you're in bad shape and so on. That's all right. There's always an equalizer. That's right. Amen. <laughs> yeah. You know, I have deacons, 
You know what a deacon is? It comes from the Greek word deacon. It means a rat killer. <laughs> Rats, wolves, the whole thing. Right? There's always an ego. And I, I, I'm be honest with you now, the bottom line is I, I, I talk to the Lord. And if you're a wolf, you're in big trouble with God. So the Bible says in Titus 1, verse 7, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-will, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but love of hospitality, love of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holy, fast, a faithful word, as he had been taught that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So that's what my job is. And uh, I have to be qualified. I've got to be, you know, uh, sound in my doctrine, plus the effects of the doctrine in my life. So, you know, you think about what the Bible says here, being a steward, it's one who is charged of the affairs and property of another, who does the church, uh, who, who does the church belong to, belongs to the Lord. It's not my church. You know, I'm, I'm passing through. I'm going to do my part. But you're going to have another pastor one day. And so the, the pastor is an overseer or a steward of God's work. And there must be a submission uh, there that um, uh, he, he has over the flock. So notice Hebrews 13. And uh, notice Hebrews 13. We'll look at verse 7. And the Bible says in verse 7 of chapter 13, um, Remember them that have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, consenting into their conversation. So the, the Bible says here, you follow my faith. Why? Because the Bible says, I'm here as an example to believers. And uh, follow my, the end of my conversation, my lifestyle. And so he, then he says in verse 17, uh, I'm sorry, verse 13, he says, uh, Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp bearing uh, re, uh, I'm sorry, reproach. And then he goes on into verse 17, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that's unprofitable for who? Us. Yeah. So again, if I'm a faithful minister, a faithful overseer, my responsibility is going to give an account for you before the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, if you're a troublemaker or you, you know, uh, you're contentious or you're going to argue and cause problems in the congregation, that's not going to be profitable for you. It's not. So, uh, again, uh, this is what the Bible says, and uh, I, I want to give a good report for everyone. Amen. And uh, I would say most of our church, I could do that. Now, the church has positions just like a family. When everyone is in their proper place, the family functions right. When uh, some are out of place, then there are no problems. I'm sorry, there, there are problems. What is the position of God's family? So we, we see as uh, specifically his local church. Again, the idea is submission to God and his authority. Submission to the scriptures. Uh, but our position is one to another is unity. Now, we love our Father, the head of our, our family, the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we love him, we want to please him. And uh, we, we love him, one another, and submit to one another for the sake of unity. Now, I want to stop here. It's not, I'm not going to preach long. Um, but I want to talk to you about unity. I want everyone to listen. I don't want any daydreaming, right? So I think about unity. I know that, you know, as our, our graph family, 
we're unified. Right? I, I love my wife. She loves me. I think. Just teasing. Um, you know, my, well, I love my kids. I love my uh, daughter-in-laws. Uh, my family. I, I, we're all unified, best to know. And uh, Coco's are unified. You know, so are all your families. You're unified. But I think of the church, and I say, you know, the church is a pillar and ground of the truth. The Bible says the church of the living God. So God is observing our church. Amen? Amen? Right. So he watches us. He watches our, our, what we do and what we think. I tell you, a long time ago, I've been saved for 40-something years. A long time ago, when I was a young Christian, I had worked these things out. You know, I had hard feelings toward people. I was an immature Christian. And uh, after a couple of times of apologizing, I said, that's enough of that. <laughs> I was, you know, I can straighten myself out. And uh, I'm not going to find offense. I started growing in the Lord. So I, and I'm thankful for that. Because I've learned a long time ago, I've got to be unified with our church. Now, I know there were people in our church up in East Grand Forks that came in, and, uh, I, you know, we, we love our brethren, and they joined the church, but I knew that some of these people were not right, not sound, probably unsaved, to be honest with you. And, uh, but I, I maintained my Christianity. I forgive people. And uh, these people said some horrible things about me. Fine. That's all right. I loved them in spite of what they said and so on. I, I grew in the Lord. I became what God wanted me to be. Amen. And uh, when I think about looking down, the importance of being unified. So not are we just unified in the Graff family, but we're also in the family of God. And it's so important that we're unified. And people say, well, you know, Pastor, you offended me. Well, there was a couple sitting here today. I asked them to you know, move, remove the child, but I guess they have a bunch of children there, so they moved them all. Just kidding. But they all left. I didn't know. I didn't know what they were doing. I didn't know. But you don't sacrifice, you know, the multitude for one. You sacrifice one for the multitude. That's what the Bible teaches so if someone's going to be offended, what can I do? I, it's not my fault. So uh, you, know, you don't sacrifice, again, the multitude for one, one child. And I, I know the child has issues, but, you know, there's places we can put them uh, so we can all concentrate on the Word of God. So in other words, there should be no disunity with the Godhead. God is one, and uh, and always forever in agreement God, the Godhead is one so the Father's in unity with the Son the Son's in unity with the Father the Son is in unity with the Spirit the Spirit is in unity with the Father and the Son and so on and so forth so it's, it, it, just like God is unified in the Godhead then we should be unified as a church and it just just tears me up in, uh, in my life spiritually, it just bothers me to no end that people be, people be disunified. So what does the Bible say? Matt, if I had an issue with you, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to talk to Tim about it. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to see you. John, if I had an issue with you, I'd come see you. I'm not going to talk to your son Paul about it. Right? So this is what we need to do. We need to talk things out. And if you can't come to a, re a resolution, then the idea is that you've you got to forgive. And how do you forgive? For Christ's sake. So I think about, you know, what people have hard feelings over and issues over and so on and so forth. But my, my thought is this. Whatever the issue is over, I know you've done it. So I had, I've had issues with pastors. And uh, 
they've sinned against me. So you say, well, did you forgive me? Absolutely. I hold no hard feelings. But there's some pastors, I think of two of them, I don't trust. People forfeit things. So I, I told one pastor, I wrote to him, and I told him, I said, I appreciate your apology. I, I just don't trust you. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I was right. I, I don't trust him. That's okay. He made a mistake. I'm gonna, if I see him in a meeting or where I see him, I'll, I'll go up and shake his hand and, you know, and things be normal. But I, I'm not going to check my arm for my watch when I leave them. Right? So, again, you know, uh, as much as lieth within you, live peaceably with all men. Now, God knew us. He knew that we're, what we're capable of. And you say, well, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I'm sorry, I made a mistake. That's fine. But if people forfeit things, that's fine also. But you've got to forgive. You've got to forgive. So, unity, oneness, united, absence of uh, uh, d- uh, disunity, oneness of mind, feeling, harmony, agreement. Listen to this verse in Psalm 133, 1. Behold how good... And how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. In Romans 12, verse 16, be of the same mind towards one another. In Romans chapter 14, verse 19, uh, the Bible says that there are there's things that make for peace. And uh, things that edify. And that's the way we should live our lives. We should seek to be a blessing. We shouldn't have issues. I mean this with all my heart. Because you're going to answer to God one day. And I think of people who are in disunity. I say, you know, how could they? They're coming to the house of God. Again, you know, do, do you, are there schisms or divisions or is there edification? Do you mean things to edify? Do you mean words to edify? Do you, do you use heart's words to edify? Does gossip edify? Does rebellion edify? Does bitterness, bitterness edify? Does arguing edify? Does the unsubmissiveness edify? The idea is this, is that God sees everything. If you think you have a relationship with God like you and God like this and the rest of us are down here, it's not that way at all. You're a legion in your own mind. A legend, I'm sorry, in your own mind. <laughs> so let's go to Romans 15, please. Romans 15, and we pick it up here in verse 5. The Bible says, Now the God of patience, consolation, grant you to be like-minded one to another, uh, according, uh, another co- according to Christ Jesus, that you may be one mind, one mouth, glorify God, even as the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not listening, but I hear things over the years how people are in disunity in our church. I, to be honest with you, best, best to know I'm right with everyone here. Amen. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm right with everyone, but it grieves me. When I hear about this one, it's upset with this one, this one, the, and it's not much, but it's here. I think, you know, I, I want to bear my heart to you that what I do is every week I'm praying for Wednesday night. I'm praying for Sunday. I'm asking God to give me a, a message from heaven. I'm, I'm, I'm praying to the Lord that lead me, show me, help me, my study, what, what book you want me to get into, whatever it is. I do this every day. And then I find some, some people that are not right with each other. It grieves me. 
I'm thinking, how in the world do you not get unity? And how do you not understand what the Bible says about forgiving for Christ's sake? To me, that's Christianity 101. It's basic. So the Bible speaks here in verse 6, one mind indicates a unity of sentiment, of feeling, of purpose. One mouth, unity of heart and mind. First, unity of mouth. Next, as a result, uh, we, we find that it's not just what we think, but what we say. And those Second Corinthians chapter, uh, let me just read it, quote it to you. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, the God of love and peace shall be with you. Uh, and this is what we want. We want the God of peace to be with us. So I think about the attendance we had this morning. A very good attendance right now. But I think the attendance, there wasn't a person saved. I say to myself, I knew I was right. I was right with God. I was right with my fellow man. I wanted this disunity here. Now we had some people come up after the service and, you know, make, want to make an appointment with me and so on, which is great. But to me, how is that week after week after week after week after week after week, week there's some people that sit here unmoved? It grieves me. And I think we're all pulling in the same direction to solve a lot of problems. So we see the position of family, the purpose of the family. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4, please. Ephesians 4. And notice, if you would, um, verse 12 to 14. The Bible says, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying body of Christ, to be all come in the, in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto a, the measure of a statue of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, but the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby, in lie, uh, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, they grow up into him in all things, which is a head, uh, even Christ. So the Bible says here in verse 13, unto a perfect man, on the measure of statue of the fullness of Christ. So the Bible speaks to you about, in a family, we want to raise our children, grow up, and be mature. I mean, that's the goal. And so it's, in the church, it's Christ-likeness. Now turn your Bibles, please, and go to Colossians chapter 1. And notice verse 28. The Bible says, when we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, and he may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And then notice chapter 4, verse 2, continuing prayer and watching in the same with thanksgiving. So God wants us to, uh, you know, produce mature Christians. And we have a lot of mature Christians here, which we're thankful for. And isn't that the goal of raising children to adult life? that they may be mature. Well, same thing in, in the Lord's church. We want to raise them to perfection or Christ-likeness. Now, how many people do you know in this area that is Christ-like? And what could this church do for the Lord if every person was motivated in the Lord by uh, growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Our, our church would be a powerhouse. I told someone not too long ago that they would be a dynamic Christian if they would uh, do this and this and this. So 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example. And what, what does maturing do? It usually means marriage and reproduction. And that, that's what it's all about in a church, is reproducing ourselves. So when, when one has matured, there's going to be a reproduction. So we see the position of the family, the purpose of the family, the uh, perfecting of the family. Notice chapter 5, verse 29, please. 
And the Bible says, verse 29, for no man ever yet hate his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. So we see if one is going to mature physically, mentally, emotionally, they have to be nourished. And so let's go to 1 Timothy and notice verse four, chapter 4, please. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And notice if you would, verse 13. The Bible says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Verse 15. Meditate upon these things, and thyself holy to them, that thy profit may be to all. And then notice 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, notice, if you would, uh, verse uh, 15. And that from a child that has known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise in the salvation through faith, that which is in Christ Jesus, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in right, righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So the Bible tells us here the importance of reading the Scriptures. And the importance here uh, is profitable for what? Doctrine. So important to know what you believe. And it's important to know what you believe about salvation, what you believe about eternal security, what you believe about the New Testament church, what you believe about Bible prophecy. All these things are important. And to say, well, I don't know what I believe about that. Well, study. Right. Yeah. We, we have a, so many opportunities for us to study. We have lessons in the church, and we want to have to share them with you. So it's so important to have proper diet and then a proper discipline. Notice First Timothy chapter 4, and we'll go back to chapter 4, and notice if you would, verse 8 and 9. But bodily exercise profits little. That's why I don't exercise. <laughs> but godliness is profitable in all things having promise of life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. So we, we see that there's uh, proper discipline. And the idea is what we do, we, we have to apply ourselves to godliness. And then the last thing we look at today is the protection of the family. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And notice, if you would, verse 11. And the Bible says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother, knows he's called a brother, be a fornicator, a covetous, an idolater, a railer, a drunkard, or extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. So God tells us here, there's got to be separation on life. And if a brother is called uh, a brother, then make sure he's right living and uh, be careful of that. And then 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, and if any man obey not our word by the epistle, note that man and have no company with them, that you may be ashamed. That you may be ashamed. You uh, yet count him not as an enemy, but uh, admonish him as a brother. And then, last of all, let's go to Romans chapter sixteen. Romans sixteen, if you would, and then we'll close. So Romans sixteen, and we pick them here in verse. Uh, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. So the Bible tells us here in verse 18, but they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So God tells us to mark people. 
which cause divisions and, and, and offenses contrary to the doctrine you've learned and avoid them. So that word avoid them speaks of you're going down a, a, a street, you get to the other side. Avoid them. And, uh, you know, I have to tell you, this is, goes back to following my faith. I've practiced this stuff my whole life. I've run into people who've been disciplined out of our church years ago. I was, I was kind to them, but I wasn't going to, you know, spend the whole day schmoozing them. You know, I was gracious, but I wasn't going to spend time there. I was confronted. I saw him. I said, hello, how are you? And then we moved on. So it's so important that we treat our church as a family. Right? And what do we do with God? Total submission. What do we do with the son? Total submission. What do we do with the father, the wife, the children? They're all in submission. And they're doing God's will for their life. All right. Well, let's stand. We'll close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this time. We pray, Father, you bless our church and help us to strive to be unified in every area of our lives. And Father, I pray that we would not allow prejudice. I pray we would not allow hard feelings. But rather, Father, we would forgive one another and move on and do your will for our lives. And may we grow and be Christ-like in every area of our lives. We ask all this in Jesus' name.